This is Amy Jordan from the Michigan chapter of the American Planning Association. I just wanted to um, welcome everybody. We're going to get started here in just uh, another moment here. Welcome to today's CM Law Credit webinar on the topic Regulating Sand and Gravel Mining, Lessons from Michigan. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Chapter Divisions webcast series. The series provides APA members with up to 40 CM credits at no cost, which of course is great for all of us on a tight budget. You can follow the uh, webcast series on Twitter and Facebook. And you'll also find that there's an archive of these distance learning webcasts at the Utah Chapters site. For those of you who have not checked that out, I find the easiest way to get there is log into your APA account, go to the Chapters page, click on Utah, and up on the right -hand, uh, upper right-hand corner of their uh, homepage, you'll see the webcast button. We're coming to you today from the offices of the Michigan Association of Planning. MAP is the APA chapter here in Michigan. And I would like to thank our executive director, Andrea Brown, AICP, for hosting us, and Amy Jordan and Lauren Car Carlson of the staff for providing us technical assistance. The Michigan Association of Planning has approximately 1,000 professional members and another 3,000 members who are local officials here in Michigan. The Michigan chapter will be sponsoring an upcoming ethics credit webinar entitled Your Ethical Responsibility to Social Equity on March 22nd. The featured presenter will be APA Pres President Mitch Silver, AICP. You may want to uh, log in and, and uh, sign up for that one because, of course, the ethics credits are hard to come by and Mitch is a wonderful speaker. You should be able to uh, log your CM credits um, shortly after today's broadcast. If you wish to ask a question of the presenters at the end, you can type it into the question box or go to the um, on the GoToWebinar menu. You'll see that on your menu if you've never done this before. Uh, today's webinar should also be available in the archive on the Utah Chapters website by early next week. Uh, typically they're available shortly after broadcast. Today's webinar is sponsored by APA's Small Town and Rural Planning Division. Dave Gaddis, FAICP of Benbrook, Texas, is our STAR Division Chair. My name is David Birchler. I am Secretary Treasurer of STAR and will moderate today's webinar. I want to uh, give Dave Gaddis a special thank you for letting me moderate since we were based in Michigan today. The Small Town and Rural Planning Division is a group of over 500 small town and rural planners with the mission to promote and support planning excellence at the small town and rural level and to facilitate communication and collaboration among small town and rural planners. A few examples of STAR's current activities include hosting an eight credit mobile workshop to Catalina Island, offering a CM credit dinner meeting on tourism planning, and presenting a conference session on the future of small town planning amid state and local budget cuts at the 2012 APA conference in Los Angeles. The uh, Catalina Island workshop is proving to be very popular. Registration is very solid for that one. We also publish a quarterly electronic newsletter appropriately titled Small Town and Rural Planning. 
and we have a presence on Facebook and LinkedIn where we have a discussion page. Our annual awards program, Celebrating Excellence in Small Town and Rural Planning, has a March 5th application deadline, so there is still time for you to get your small town plan or program submitted. We nominate worthy small town and rural planners for election to AICP's College of Fellows. We monitor and support legislation at the federal level that affects small towns and rural communities. And we provide graduate planning students with internship support to gain work experience in small town and rural settings. If you'd like more information about the STAR Division and how you can join, our webpage is listed at the bottom of the current slide. Today's webinar, Regulating Sand and Gravel Mining Lessons from Michigan, was originally presented during the Bettman Symposium at the 2011 APA conference in Boston. Our three speakers have updated that material for a special presentation today. Leading off with the local planning and zoning history behind Kaiser versus Casson Township is Trudy Gala, AICP. Trudy has been a resident of Leelanau County nearly her entire life and has been employed with Leelanau County for 23 years, serving as planning director the last 15 years. Trudy is a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners and holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Central Michigan University with a double major in Earth Science and Geography and a minor in Conservation. Providing the procedural history and the competing arguments, we will hear from Mark Wyckoff, FAICP. Mark is a professor at Michigan State University, where he serves as Senior Associate Director of the Land Policy Institute and Director of the Planning and Zoning Center. Mark is a community planner with 35 years of experience, 24 years running a private sector consulting business, and is a fellow of the American Institute of Certified Planners. He also edits and publishes the Michigan-specific monthly magazine, Planning and Zoning News, which is now in its 30th year. Finally, the Michigan Supreme Court decision and the legislature's response will be covered by Professor Richard K. Norton. Dick Norton is chair and associate professor of urban and regional planning program at the University of Michigan's Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning, where he teaches planning law and state and local land use management. Dick holds a PhD in city and regional planning and a JD from the University of North Carolina as well as master's degrees in public policy studies and environmental management from Duke University. Uh, with my lowly bachelor's degree in planning, you can see why I'm only the moderator and because uh, I'm in uh, very high company. Without further delay, here's Trudy Gala to begin today's presentation. Thank you for that introduction. I'm going to start by giving you first a little picture of what Casson Township looks like and then a brief history on gravel and sand operations in the township. And that will set the stage for our next two presenters who will discuss what happened in the courts, the changes to Michigan law, and where things stand right now. So a little information first on Leelanau County. We are a small county in northern Michigan with a 2010 population of just over 21,000. We are surrounded by water on three sides by Lake Michigan. We have four islands. And we're the second smallest county in the state by size, with, with just 348 square miles. And you can see it on this slide. It's highlighted in the dark blue. The next slide is a little bit of information about Casson Township. And you can see an area that is outlined in the lower left on that map, which is the, the square designation. That's Casson Township, with a population of just over 1,600 from the 2010 census. And then on the right-hand side is an article that came from our local newspaper. And it shows a drawing of the gravel district, which is approximately 3,100 acres and sits almost right smack in the middle of Casson Township. On the next slide, I have a few photos for you to look at. Uh, just kind of outlining that there's, there's a variety of land uses in this township. It's not just sand and gravel operations. There are farming operations. There are all different types of farms, such as horses, alpacas, and lava ranches. There are county and township parks, as well as federal and state lands, logging and maple syrup operations, a small town, which is the town of Maple City, a landfill, and, of course, the sand and gravel operations. Uh, next slide, please. 
throughout the history of this issue in Casson Township, which, by the way, is uh, the longest running planning and zoning issue in the county, the township has tried to balance the interests of the residents with the need for gravel excavation. So they did quite a few things. Back in September of 1989, which was uh, about a year and a half after I started work here at the county, they eliminated a business three district in the township zoning ordinance and created two separate districts. They did a district for earth removal, quarrying, gravel extraction, mining, and related mineral extraction, and then a second district for landfills. The only landfill in this region is located in the southern area of Casson Township, and it is privately owned. In 1994, they then did an amendment which deleted the reference to related mineral extraction businesses, and they replaced it with mining. At that time, there was a proposed asphalt plant to um, come into the township, and after much opposi opposition from citizens, the township removed that wording to eliminate any plant coming into their area. There are asphalt operations located in the county to the south of Leelanau County. In 1995, they then approved an amendment to provide for special land uses and the permits and inspections and so forth that go along with it. They also approved a new master plan and conducted a citizen survey. And then in 1997, they adopted a new zoning ordinance. They had the gravel district identified. They had maps in the master plan and the zoning ordinance to guide future decisions on these extractive operations. And the master plan was very explicit in recommending that these operations be confined to the existing district. On the next slide, we have some further information with regard to the court case that we're specifically talking about today. And this started back in 2003 with a rezoning request from Mrs. Edith Kaiser. The township reviewed this case in 2003, and then it was reviewed by the county about a month later in November of 2003. But as you can see on this slide, and I'll explain a little bit later, the final decision was not made by the township board to more than a year after this time. On this map, outlined in green, is Kaiser's property, and it has the red stars, which kind of depict the corners of her property. Adjacent and immediately to the east of her property is the gravel extraction operation. Moving on to the next slide. This is a little history of what led up to this. In 2003, Kaiser hired a firm to do a gravel volume survey of 188 acres of her property. After the County Planning Commission meeting in November, the results from that survey were released, which showed a substantial volume of marketable gravel on the site. It also showed an average of 30-foot depth of gravel throughout the zoning district. Kaiser's reasons for asking for the rezoning request included economic reasons. Her husband was now deceased. She was looking at the property for retirement income and wanted to do some home repairs and fix up on the property. Also, she listed the time, money, and effort that were already spent in preparing all the documents for the rezoning and to get ready for gravel extraction. She stated she was only requesting a rezoning of part of the total 236 acres she owned felt there was a need for the gravel, and there were mining and gravel operations occur occurring close by the site. And we got a footnote down here that the township minutes during the development of that gravel district, which was prior to Kaiser's rezoning request, show that her husband at the time was against his property being placed into the district and was also against the district going any further west than County Road 669, which it does go west of that. And this information all also came out in the court case. Next slide. Uh, from our staff report then, the township master plan was cited, and we noted in there that the gravel district was proposed to confine that gravel mining to areas already being mined into those areas identified as having the best deposits for mining, and it was the commission's position that sufficient deposits already existed in that area for the foreseeable future, and no other area in the township should be developed for the purpose. We used our geographic information system at the county to reveal that there were about 3,100 acres or 89 parcels in the township that were already zoned for gravel, which accounted about 14% of the township's total acreage. We also looked within the actual gravel district and saw that there were 367 acres being not mined or about 12% of that total gravel district area. And here are a couple maps that were included in the staff report and also ended up in the circuit court case. 
On the left is the zoning map. So in the middle, you will see the light yellow area, which is the gravel district, surrounded by a light green area as the ag district. And then the very dark green is forested district. And the red stars on both of these maps depict the location of Mrs. Kaiser's rezoning request. During the court case, one of the questions that came up is, well, in the gravel district, there are only a few people who own the land, and they're controlling all the gravel operations. So as part of the maps that were developed in the court case, we looked at the ownership, and each one of these colors that are on the right-hand side depict different owners within that gravel district. So it was a way to show that there were actually numerous owners within that gravel district and not just uh, very few. Now I want to uh, show you very quickly the future land use map. You can see the gravel district again in the middle, and that outlines exactly the boundaries of what it is on the zoning map. The red stars again are Mrs. Kaiser's property. And then you can see the surrounding agricultural land and forested land. I mentioned the landfill earlier, and that is down in the right-hand corner in that kind of dark blue or purplish color. Next slide. Now, going back just a moment, I mentioned that the township board did not act on Mrs. Kaiser's request for more than a year. And the reason for that was there were five members on the township board, and three of them declared a conflict of interest. There were three of them that either owned a share in gravel operations occurring in the township or were receiving royalties for operations on the property. So they consulted with the township attorney who advised them they could not vote on it because of a quorum. And then they also could not vote on Ms. Kaiser's request because there was not a quorum left of members. So Kaiser's attorney challenged this with an argument that there may be a majority of remaining members that could act on this request, but nothing happened with that. Next slide. Thank you. A little more history on this. And Lake Luna excavating case came forward at about the same time that Mrs. Kaiser's request came forward. And that was to rezone 68 acres from a forested to a gravel district. They were asking for a parcel to be rezoned that was already adjacent to a parcel they owned in the gravel district being used for extractive operations. So they wanted to add on to the parcel with property they already owned by modifying the boundaries of that gravel district. It was recommended for approval by the Township Planning Commission on a vote of 3 to 2. The county agreed with the township on that recommendation went to the township board, they cited conflict of interest, and later this request was denied. Now, Lake Leland Excavating filed suit, mediation filed, and then the township stated they could not act on this case until Kaiser's case was resolved, and then the case was later dismissed. And it's my understanding that it was dismissed merely because of a technicality that papers were not filed within a period of time in the court system. So it was a case that was dismissed. The township was also sued earlier in 1998 over a different type of development. It was a planned unit development for residential use in the township, and at that time their master plan was challenged in the court case, and the township did prevail on that. They've had a history of numerous rezoning requests since the early 80s. They've also had two referendum cases which overturned local decision and rezoned property to gravel use, which the township had denied. These were all prior to Mrs. Kaiser's request. Now, going back to that meeting of Mrs. Kaiser's uh, request before the township board, it came to the township board in December of 2004, and there was a change of one member on the board. So they only had two members left that had a conflict, and there was a recommendation on this, and the township denied Mrs. Kaiser's rezoning request. So the reasons they cited for this were there's already 3,100 acres in the gravel district with just a small amount of that being mined, so there's adequate land available for gravel extraction. The request was not compatible with the township's master plan. The township planning commission had recommended denial, and in the staff report from county planning, it was stated in there that unless there's a demonstrated shortage of gravel deposits, staff felt there would be no reason to necessitate zoning at this time. Next slide. So just a little summary here to um, kind of wind this up a little bit. In 2004, that township denied the rezoning of the property. Kaiser filed lawsuit, and you're going to hear about that a little bit further from our next two speakers. The complaint was filed in February 2004, which was 10 months prior to the township board making the final decision. 
In January 2005, that case was removed from a stay and placed on the appellate docket. Amended complaint was filed. I was called as a township witness, and I completed an affidavit and two sessions for depositions. Our county planning commission minutes were taken, and uh, the recommendation was entered into the record, which, by the way, I can tell you from experience with a couple court cases we've gone through already on this, that is very important to capture in the minutes the decision that's made, as well as all the reasons for that decision. Now, following that, Kaiser's attorney requested that my deposition, as well as the deposition of another professional planner that the township hired, be thrown out and we'd be removed as witnesses. But that was denied, and both of us did end up testifying in this circuit court case. Some of the documents and studies that were conducted by both sides are, are quite extensive. I've listed a few of these here. Maps that were done were zoning, master plan, ownership maps, aerials, recent sales in the area. There were studies such as appraisals of vacant property and home sales, traffic and noise studies, valuations of the properties within the district and within the township, and numerous interviews with neighbors concerning issues such as noise, dust, and hours of operation. Next slide. In 2006, the Honorable Thomas Power heard this court case, and one of the things he stated in his bench trial decision was that Casson Township was both blessed and cursed with a large deposit of what apparently is a very good quality gravel. The trial court applied the Silver versus Adis Township. No very serious consequences rule in this decision, and the trial court struck down the township's decision, and uh, Judge Power ruled that the township could not enforce the agricultural zoning on Mrs. Kaiser's property or interfere with her right to have a gravel operation. He stated that operations could not occur after 5.30 p.m., and township permitting and regulation processes had to be filed. Casson Township filed an appeal. And we get down to my last slide before we lead into the next two speakers, who will we'll go into the court cases in more detail. We looked back and you know looked at why did Casson Township file this appeal? And it was an important case for them. It was precedent setting. They had a desire to uphold the township's right to plan and zone under Michigan statutes. The property of Mrs. Kaiser's, uh, Mrs. Kaiser's request was outside the gravel district and not in compliance with the township's master plan. They noted that sand and gravel existed all throughout the township. If they could not plan for this use, could they plan for any uses in the township? They had numerous citizen petitions against this rezoning. And they had already upheld their master plan on a previous case. That was that planned unit development case I mentioned. And they felt they had to move forward and also uphold their master plan in zoning on this case. The township master plan, the zoning ordinance, minutes, and other information can be found on our website, which is listed in the bottom right-hand corner here. And that is basically a brief outline of how this all got started. And so I will turn it over to Mark now, who's going to explain more about Michigan planning and zoning and what happened with that appeal. Thank you, Trudy. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> this is Mark Wyckoff. Um, I'm just coming out of a period of laryngitis, uh, so I hope that uh, you can hear me. You might need to turn your, your volume up a bit. The uh, one other thing, uh, um, Andrea Brown here at the Michigan Chapter American Planning Association is going to be posting these slides from this presentation on the MAP website. So for those of you who don't want to go and listen to the entire thing, again, uh, just the PowerPoint slides will be available for your review. I want to <clears throat> talk about the uh, uh, procedural history that was involved in this case and some of the competing arguments that were advanced. Uh, as you have already heard, it's a pretty complex uh, history uh, at the local level. You have several decades of conflict uh, that the, the township attempted to resolve through a special study to identify where its gravel resources were, to incorporate what they learned into a plan, and to zone consistent with that plan. And then, of course, the challenges uh, that occurred uh, since then in the Kaiser case, but they really uh, did all that to try and prevent more uh, lawsuits that occurred prior to that. But the context uh, in Michigan is even broader than uh, the situation in Casson Township. 
we have uh, a lot of minerals in Michigan, which is not unusual. Many states in the country are similarly situated. Our, our huge amount of sand and gravel is because the um, uh, glaciers came through uh, three times and mixed everything uh, up pretty significantly. Uh, but we also have uh, limestone and iron, copper, gypsum, uh, a lot of uh, oil and natural gas under the ground. So we have a lot of uh, mining activity. And the rule that we're going to talk about that the court established to deal with mining uh, does not apply just to sand and gravel. It applies to other mineral resources. Now, Michigan's uh, Planning and Zoning Enabling Acts were uh, very much on the traditional models. Uh, we consolidated three Planning and Enabling Acts into one in 2008. Uh, <clears throat> that was uh, the act authorizing planning in cities and villages a separate one authorizing it in township and townships, and the third one authorizing planning in counties. Uh, then uh, just two years prior to that, we consolidated the three zoning enabling acts for the same governmental unit types into one statute. Uh, in the process, we had an opportunity to uh, uh, do a little bit of modernizing of those statutes. And generally speaking, there's local authority uh, in Michigan to regulate nearly all uh, land uses. There are some exceptions. For example, um, townships and counties are not permitted to regulate uh, oil and gas extraction. Uh, that is uh, regulated by a state agency. We do have uh, a couple of provisions in our uh, Zoning Enabling Act that are unique nationally. One of them is the section you see on the screen now, 207, uh, which is a section that deals with what we call exclusionary zoning. This is a section that prohibits municipalities from excluding lawful land uses uh, in the presence of a demonstrated need unless the community can demonstrate that there isn't any uh, location within that unit of local government or the surrounding area, which is typically viewed as a market area, uh, for appropriately locating that use. Um, <clears throat> that's a, a, a sort of an unusual provision that puts a burden on municipalities to plan for these difficult land uses, uh, as Casson Township had done in this particular case. The context for the case also includes uh, an old court opinion in Michigan, the uh, Silva versus Ada Township case. This is a 1982 appellate court decision that the court acknowledged something that is, is fairly obvious to anyone that deals with land use issues, and that is that minerals can only be mined where they exist. But the problem with that particular um, opinion is that it then elevated this uh, physical consideration over other local planning and zoning considerations, such as the traditional ones that would exist relative to impacts on abutting properties and so on. In effect, the Michigan Michigan court gave minerals what we call a preferred use status. And that's a term actually that the court coined because there were two sets of land uses prior to minerals that the courts uh, were actually quite tired of getting local uh, planning and zoning disputes before them. One had to do with manufactured housing or mobile homes. The other had to do with apartments. And <clears throat> the court felt that in many cases, municipalities were being exclusionary. And for a brief period of time, they elevated those land uses to preferred use status, uh, giving them uh, nearly carte blanche authority to establish where they wanted to. Uh, ultimately, the court said, no, that didn't really make any sense. Um, we've got to consider a variety of other, other factors. But in the meantime, this, this mining case came along, and it was one of those where a type of uh, use was given preferred use status. Now, in the Silva case, the uh, Michigan court created a rule which had the effect of allowing mining virtually anywhere um, except where there were going to be, quote, very serious consequences. And while the court didn't define that in its opinion, um, several cases that came down after that where municipalities attempted to explain uh, why they were opposed to the mining operations, the impacts on adjoining properties, the uh, problems and impacts of the haul routes and the noise and size of the trucks, 
especially where those routes uh, intersected with uh, uh, bus routes for school kids. Um, all of those were factors that municipalities were using as arguments against uh, the uh, future sand and gravel operations and saying that those were very serious consequences. With one exception, um, the Michigan court rejected all of those arguments in subsequent cases. In the one case, which was a Highland Township case, where uh, the court uh, accepted the arguments, it was a large, uh, very high quality sand and gravel um, resource uh, that the industry had owned for several decades, but the land around it had developed into uh, high value uh, suburban homes and a very large number of not only the homes but uh, families with children and bus routes uh, were involved and uh, the community was able to demonstrate that uh, the impact of hauling the gravel out was going to be in fact very serious consequences. But other than that, most of the cases had gone against the municipalities because of the very serious consequences rule. Now, in terms of the relationship of local planning to zoning in Michigan, uh, we're like most of the states in the country. Planning um, the master plan in particular is supposed to be the basis for the zoning ordinance, but the courts have not always consistently recognized that. Um, most often, though, uh, where they have sustained zoning, um, um, and do point at all to the master plan, they acknowledge that the plan um, provides a, a rational basis for the action that's being uh, implemented through the zoning ordinance. Now because we have 83 counties and about 1,242 townships, we have a structure in place where either townships or counties can zone. Um, if you have um, township zoning, they do need to uh, send their proposed rezoning request to the county for review and comment prior to uh, them taking action. In many of those counties, like Leelanau County, where Trudy works, uh, the county planning uh, staff provides technical assistance, not only to the individual townships uh, on uh, specific uh, uh, land use uh, issues, but also in the form of uh, training programs and uh, sample ordinance language and so on. And Leelanau County does a, a tremendous amount of that, um, particularly notable given the small size of the county involved. Now the problem here is that when you have a court rule that's been established and applied a large number of times, um, you are then faced with the dawning challenge of trying to overturn established case law. So when the Kaiser case came along, <clears throat> the Court of Appeals, no matter what they may have thought relative to the facts, felt compelled to apply the Silva Rule and support uh, the plaintiff Kaiser. So you're in a situation where the municipality is not permitted to uh, basically address the land use issue in the same way they would with any other land use. Now, it turns out that another case that was working its way through the appellate court system in Michigan at the same time uh, may have had a lot to do with the ultimate outcome here, and that was the Hemdy versus Putnam Township case. Uh, this was a case that largely dealt with the issue of ripeness um, being uh, was the particular uh, proposal to rezone land uh, for a planned unit development ripe for court adjudication at that point, or um, did the developer jump the gun and go to court before getting a final decision at the local level. Um, but it also dealt with allegations of exclusionary zoning. And as you can, uh, as you're about to hear in the Kaiser case, uh, the exclusionary zoning issue was one of the issues that was raised uh, in this particular case on appeal. And it also then permitted the Michigan Supreme Court to consider two cases at the same time that dealt with the same issue, even though they dealt with them in very different ways. Now this case um, has so many oddities about it, it is, it is uh, quite amazing. It almost never got to the Michigan Supreme Court at all because the appeal that was filed from the Court of Appeals to the um, Supreme Court uh, was initially denied. And it is, it is highly unusual for the court to first of all reconsider a denial and uh, secondly, even if they do reconsider it, to uh, support uh, the uh, hearing of the case, but 
In this particular denial, there were two justices that filed a lengthy dissent, and um, they <coughs> cited the large number of very detailed and well-prepared amicus briefs that were filed prior to the Court of Appeals decision, which is also highly unusual. Normally, we get uh, amicus briefs filed only uh, before the Michigan Supreme Court. In this case, there were quite a number filed before the Court of Appeals. And then the second thing was the Hendy case um, coming before it at the same time, uh, arguing one common issue. So um, a little bit, uh, almost two weeks after the court initially denied accepting the case on appeal, on the court's own motion and not on the motion of the uh, plaintiffs and the other appellants, uh, the court um, denial to leave to appeal was set aside, and they agreed to hear the case. Um, I've been following appellate court decisions in Michigan for a little over 35 years now. I don't ever recall this having occurred before. I have talked to a number of municipal attorneys who said that, yeah, it does happen, but it is uh, extremely rare. So we ended up with the case being able to go to uh, the Michigan Supreme Court. What uh, is very important to consider at this particular point is the royal role of the American Planning Association and the Michigan Association of Planning uh, in the case. And some of you may see a parallel to uh, issues in your own states and may decide that you might want to uh, take advantage of some of the resources available at the American Planning Association. In this particular case, the township attorney um, uh, prior to the decision uh, at the Court of Appeals uh, felt that uh, the township had done everything that it was supposed to do, but it lost because of this very serious consequences rule and uh, at the uh, circuit court level and that he was afraid the same thing was the result was going to come from the Court of Appeals. So he reached out to see if there wasn't some support or help that he could get. He was directed to the Michigan chapter of the American Planning Association and to the American Planning Association. And the APA, as you probably know, has an amicus committee, uh, and they immediately engaged. Uh, they saw that this case was fundamentally about consistency of uh, zoning with planning. And they helped uh, the Michigan chapter secure assistance from Professor Gerald Fisher who's a, uh, an, a professor at Cooley Law School, and from Dr. Richard Norton, who's uh, sitting to my left today and one of the presenters here at the University of Michigan. Uh, the two of them teamed up on uh, several amicus briefs uh, that were filed before the Court of Appeals and then again before the, the Michigan Supreme Court. Um, the APA remained engaged uh, after the loss uh, at the Court of Appeals. Um, we believe that APA's name on the amicus brief helped to show the national significance of the case, and it probably led to several other amicus briefs being filed. And you'll see on this uh, slide the, num the uh, groups that were involved in filing the amicus briefs, the American Planning Association and MAP, and the uh, association representing Michigan townships, the association representing Michigan cities and villages, the uh, public corporation law section of the state bar, the Michigan Aggregates Association representing the sand and gravel industry, and then Michigan Paving and Materials also representing that industry. Uh, national firms were involved as well as state firms in advising on some of these amicus briefs, most of which ran uh, 50 pages, uh, not counting appendices. So there were very, very uh, well-considered and thought-out arguments that were advanced before the Court of Appeals and the Michigan Supreme Court. Now, if we look at the arguments for the plaintiffs that were advanced, um, this would be on behalf of uh, Mrs. Kaiser, the reliance on the preferred use on nature of sand and gravel mining uh, was, uh, of course, the first argument that they're going to make. And it, it's the, the, uh, that and the fact that there would be no very serious consequences uh, from the mining, in part because there's so much uh, sand and gravel mining already going on in the uh, township that it therefore ought to be uh, approved. For the industry, the silver rule had basically created a slam dunk, making it fairly easy to uh, get past a local zoning opposition. They also, though, did attack each of the township's arguments that attempted to undermine the silver rule and um, 
They concluded that the gravel resource should be extracted because there would be no very or be no real harm to come from it. Now, the arguments of the uh, mining industry, uh, mining interests, they really focused again on um, the very serious consequences ruled, and they even argued that it had a constitutional origin, and that it now had been relied upon for several decades, and that if it were to be overturned, it would create a quote undue hardship. Uh, on the landowners and industry. Um, municipalities, they argued, have an obligation to plan and zone for all natural resources, including the extraction uh, of mineral resources. And that if sand and gravel were not protected resources, along with other mineral resources, then there would be uh, surface land uses established, which would prevent the extraction at a later time of these minerals. Now. It's very interesting that in one of their amicus briefs, they really made a strong point that the lack of statewide or regional planning for the extraction of mineral resources is the real problem. In other words, municipalities don't always, always know what mineral resources exist below the surface. And so they're making surface land use decisions, whether that's for planning or zoning purposes, without always knowing what minerals are uh, below the surface. Um, my understanding is there are only a few states where there have been comprehensive mineral inventories that have been taken, and that consequently that makes it very, very difficult for land use planners to deal with um, uh, not only surface land use activities, but also subsurface um, uh, minerals that should be taken into account when surface planning is done. Now, planners and municipal interests uh, argued that no very serious consequences rule had actually been superseded by the legislature. In 1978, the language that I showed you that's presently in our um, um, Municipal Zoning Enabling Act uh, was actually first adopted, and there was virtually no change between 78 and, the, and 2006. And that that language, putting a burden on municipalities to not exclude a lawful land use, uh, and unless there was uh, no place that they could re legitimately locate it within the community, really uh, was the legislature's effort to try and deal with a wide range of difficult to site land uses. And that therefore that rule supersede the no very serious consequences rule. This was a novel argument to the Michigan Supreme Court, not one that had previously been advanced or considered. Second, that the rezoning process was circumvented by the judicial review under Silva in a way that separated the, um, the powers of, of various governmental entities, the power of a local government, of elected officials, the governing body to make a decision independent from the courts. And that separation of powers doctrine became very important, and Dick will talk about that some more. Third, that really what happened with the Silva rule is that the court had shifted the burden of proof onto the municipality to defend the ordinance instead of, as in all other cases in Michigan, the burden resting on the applicant. Um, and the, the applicant really, uh, in all other situations, has the burden to show that their particular use is not only lawful, um, but um, is being appropriately cited under the circumstances. And then last, that the township's local planning and zoning actions that led up to this district in denial were adequate to justify the reasonableness and the decision to rezone, and that the township having done that had provided for the uh, growth of the industry. Um, their own studies showed that they had probably uh, 100 years' worth of sand and gravel uh, relative to the industry need within the region that were already locked up in their um, sand and gravel district. So with that, I'm going to uh, uh, turn the microphone over to uh, Dr. Richard Norton. Okay, I'm going to talk about the law, and particularly constitutional law, and then the state legislature's response to the Michigan Supreme Court. And, and just to provide a little bit more background, um, APA and MAP filed an amicus curiae brief with the Michigan Court of Appeals that was co-authored by Jerry Fisher and myself. Jerry's a longtime municipal attorney in the state of Michigan. Uh, after the township lost the case at the Court of Appeals, um, the township engaged 
jury to represent them before the Supreme Court, and then I ended up drafting the, the briefs that were filed before the Michigan Supreme Court on behalf of, uh, of MAP and the APA. So just uh, a, little, a little bit repetitive here, but just to highlight some key points. Kassam Township refused to rezone property um, to allow gravel mining to take place because they did not want to expand their uh, gravel mining district. The trial court did what it had to do, which was to apply uh, an adjudication rule that the Michigan Supreme Court had decided 20 years prior, the No Very Serious Consequences Rule. And the basic articulation of that rule is whenever, or was, <clears throat> whenever considering a due process claim against a zoning regulation, the zoning cannot be sustained unless very serious consequences would result from the mining. Or stated another way, the zoning ordinance is going to get struck down unless the township can defend that it has to, to act to prevent the mining from taking place because of the consequences. So here's a case of the township doing everything it could and should do in terms of due process adjudication and it's still lost. And again, it lost at the Court of Appeals because the Court of Appeals did what it had to do, which was apply the Silva Rule, although there was a single dissent uh, on the three-panel court that laid out some good arguments for why that was just a screwy thing to have happened. And I think that, that appeal also provided a, an important justification for the Supreme Court to take it up uh, on appeal. And then as, as Mark mentioned, they first denied the motion for appeal, and then on their own initiative two weeks later, much to all of our surprise, um, changed its mind and took up the case. The cutting to the chase, the Supreme Court then reversed itself, which was uh, a bit of a surprise. Supreme Courts don't often reverse earlier decisions. Why did that happen? What happened with the court reversing itself? There really were two fundamental questions that apply in any legal case, and, and this is a good example of, how, of, of a concrete example. Pardon the mineral-related pun, I guess. Um, what's the appropriate form and standard for deciding whether a local regulation in general, or mining in particular, is reasonable and appropriate, and who ultimately gets to decide? This case is especially about who gets to decide, which is the proper institution to do that. And again, like all legal cases, there really are two species of kinds of claims that may pop up when a, when a local government regulates. The first being statutory claims, uh, enabling claims. Was the township clearly enabled to do what it, was, what it tried to do? Um, or, and the secondary question of what's the relationship between statutory law and common law? And then a series of constitutional claims that, as you all, I'm sure, know, typically get argued in procedural due process substantive due process, uh, equal protection, regulatory takings. In this particular case, what the court honed in on uh, were one constitutional claim and one statutory claim. And, and usually courts, when they hear claims, will go first to the statutory claim, and if they can resolve the case that way, will resolve it and never get to the constitutional claim. So it was a little bit unusual for this court to do the opposite. They went straight to the constitutional claim first, which was the substantive due process claim. And then they, after deciding that, went to the statutory claim. And, and, and there's a reason for that. I'll talk about that in, in a minute. So really the two questions the court picked up and dealt with through Kaiser were this substantive due process, which is really ultimately about was the zoning decision fair and who gets to decide? And then the second question, the statutory claim was, um, was had the had the decision earlier decision been superseded by statute? And, and I'll explain how they got to that question in a minute. As the parties played out the arguments um, for why the Michigan Supreme Court should not reverse itself, why it should not reverse the earlier Silva decision, the first argument that the plaintiff made was stare decisis. The decision has been reached. There, we shouldn't change precedent. Or alternatively, because the, the township didn't raise this until it got to the Supreme Court, they essentially waived the claim. And the Supreme Court came back. They didn't raise it. We argued in our amicus brief, and this court uh, accepted this argument, the township never waived it because they couldn't. The lower courts were incapable of reversing the Supreme Court decision 
really it's the Supreme Court where it's a relative, it's a, it's an appropriate decision to hear and decide. So that was pretty quickly set aside. The other, the key arguments then really were that the no very serious consequences rule was nothing more than a species of due process and it just provided a little bit heightened burden on um, deciding whether or not zoning should be, or regulating mining should be allowed, but it wasn't substantively different. And the, the final argument that the ZEA, the, the Zoning uh, Enabling Act amendments dealing with exclusionary zoning could not have set aside the Silva decision because Silva was dealing with a constitutional standard of, of review. Um, I'll come back to that again. That's a little bit of a complicated concept, but I'll come back to that. The, the Michigan Aggregates Association, not surprisingly, filed briefs um, favoring or supporting Kaiser, and they made the arguments, not surprising, that we need gravel. Don't regulate us. This is a, a need for our larger region. Um, and they basically were arguing localities are incapable of reasonable regulation. Every time we've dealt with localities, they've, they've stomped on us. Um, there's probably some merit to that claim, and I'll talk about that when I talk about the legislature. And the legislature has refused to act. They've not picked this up. We need the courts to intervene because of the inherent unfairness of this whole regulatory, uh, regulatory scheme. The arguments against made by the township honed in on the idea that the earlier um, amendments to the Zoning Enabling Act that prohibited exclusionary zoning had effectively superseded the No Very Serious Consequences rule. Um, this argument was pushed especially by Jerry Fisher, who, remember I uh, mentioned, had been engaged by the township to represent them in front of the Supreme Court. And Jerry, gosh, I hope Jerry's not listening to this webinar, but Jerry's been around for a while, so he remembers <laughs> a lot of the history. Um, that went behind the revisions to the Zoning Enabling Act on exclusionary zoning. And I think in his mind it was very clear that what the legislature was trying to do through those revisions dealt exactly with these kinds of cases and that it should be clear that, that they had superseded the, the act. The problem with that argument, and, and the court picked it up and, and accepted it, but they did it in a secondary way. The reason they went to the constitutional claim first and focused on that was because the very serious consequences rule on its face is a constitutional adjudication rule. It's all about how courts should treat due process claims. And so if you, if you read it on its face, it's not a statutory conflict question, it's a constitutional question. Um, but nonetheless, Jerry made a really compelling argument and the court recognized that as a secondary matter. Um, the brief that I filed and, and, and with help of the APA amicus committee really honed in on how uh, wrong this no very serious consequences rule was, what effect it had, and the kind of perversions that it had worked into Michigan's constitutional planning and zoning law. And then secondarily, what or Kaiser Kasson Township had done was entirely reasonable and that their decision should be upheld. And, and the other entities filing briefs basically f fell in line with all of these arguments and supported them. Okay, the big decision. What did the Supreme Court actually decide? Um, another thing that I, I guess I'll toot my own horn a little bit here. I went back and I read the earlier cases carefully that the Silva Court had relied upon to say we have this long established rule in Michigan establishing this no very serious consequences rule. And it became clear to me on reading those earlier cases that they did nothing of the sort. There just wasn't the judicial um, pedigree, there really was no basis for the rulings. And that, a piece of that, had been addressed by the dissenting justice ju judge in the Court of Appeals. So it prompted the Supreme Court to go back and really carefully look at these earlier decisions. And, and in a thorough analysis showed that there was no constitutional basis for this no very serious consequences rule. That in fact it had been articulated and established as such in 1982 through the Silva decision. So the first line of our argument that this is a long established rule and well settled law da, 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 really didn't hold up to scrutiny that it was a fairly recent rule. Then the court looked carefully at the way the no very serious consequences rule and held works and held that it's not just a species of a regular due process reasonable um, analysis. It really 
completely inverts, it turns due process review on its head. In fact, I've claimed and I'll continue to state that the way the no very serious consequences rule works is to give heightened judicial scrutiny to mining claims that put them on par with the very few cases the courts always do that, which are race-based discriminatory claims. In other words, the rule effectively um, ran the default against the government in favor of the plaintiff, and it forces the government to show that we have to regulate and there's absolutely no other way that we can deal with this horrible problem of gravel mining unless we have this regulation in place. And anything short of that, the property owner is going to be allowed to mine. So it, it completely inverted due process review, and the court agreed. It said this, this, um, this doctrine shifts the burden and it inverts the presumption, which then led to the third key part of their ruling, which is that the no very serious consequences rule violates the separation of powers doctrine. So here, to explain that, you have to remember that uh, the separation of powers doctrine speaks to the proper authorities of the different branches of government, the legislative, the executive, the judiciary, and what the court essentially said was, by the courts articulating these constitutional rules that create a preferred land use and, and shift the presumption that zoning regulations will be struck down, the courts have now essentially gotten into the realm of legislative decision making that's the realm of the legislature. It's not the role of the courts to make gravel mining preferred land uses through an adjudication rule. That violates the separation of powers doctrine. Um, it's wrong. So essentially, there's no pedigree for this rule. Um, it's it's inverting due process adjudication in a way that is, is atypical of how we deal with all other kinds of zoning decisions, and it violates separation of powers. The court explicitly overturns the no very serious consequences rule and overturns Silva. Silva, at that point, was not good law in Michigan. Planners and planning lawyers uh, heaved a huge sigh of relief at that point, and we thought everything was golden. Um, just to quickly recapitulate, Silva is no longer good law. Mining is not a preferred land use. The case at that point was remanded back down to the lower courts for further proceedings. Not much happened, and we thought it had been settled until last summer. And then out of the blue, uh, word went out in kind of a panicky way um, that the Michigan legislature was considering an amendment to the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act that would reestablish the civil rule in the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act itself with reference to the Silva case specifically. And I think the first, the first anybody heard about it was after a very short notice that the House uh, of Representatives was going to hear it in a committee, and the uh, Michigan Township Association representative happened to see it, and he was the only one who showed up to protest that, what are you doing, this may be a bad decision. It went through the House in lightning quick speed, and it went to the Senate for a hearing. At that point, um, a lot of folks had been notified. A lot more folks showed up at the Senate hearing, including Andrew Brown, the executive director of MAP, and myself, um, and to start providing testimony to say, basically, wait a minute, what are you doing? Let's think this through. Um, let's go slow. They delayed their action by one week to allow for some more testimony, but it was pushed through. Uh, very quickly, and in fact, in 16 calendar days, the law was was the Silva rule was restored with some modification, which is just lightning fast speed on a legislative time frame. What were the arguments that were put forward for why we need this? And and here I'm listing. I sat in these hearings and I scribbled down who's making these arguments and what are they. And at the very top of the list was job creation that by Restoring the civil rule will get some more gravel mines approved, and that will create more jobs. And that had the effect, like a lot of arguments uh, today, if you say job creation, that kind of shuts down everything else, because no legislature, no legislator wanted to be seen as, as opposing a bill that was argued, arguing for job creation. There was an interesting, I call it a manifest destiny claim, that both the House representative and the state senator who were sponsoring this legislation made it clear to state several times on the record that these minerals were put there by God and that therefore we should be mining them. It was kind of a, God put them here, 
he put them here for us to mine. We need to mine them kind of argument, uh, very much the manifest destiny kind of argument that nobody seemed to respond to. Um, the implication of that, then, the follow-on was we should be mining minerals wherever they're found because they were put here for, by God for us to mine. There was very little consideration of, well, maybe you don't need to mine them everywhere they're found. It was kind of the, you can only mine them where they're found, therefore we should mine them wherever they are found, line of reasoning. They also made uh, assertions that, that the legislature was now acting to correct the imbalance that had been created by Kaiser. Um, my retort to that was, no, Kaiser had corrected an imbalance that had been created by Silva um, because of the way the court was deciding. Um, they also, they, and I'm talking mainly the sponsor, the Senate sponsor of this legislation, responded, well, we're responding to the Kaiser Court's request for legislative redress, that the court had somehow stated in its opinion, we don't like this decision we're making, but we have to make it because we're feeling compelled to do so for constitutional law reasons. I don't see anywhere in the court's opinion where that court was making such a claim. And then, can you tell I'm a little bit biased against the arguments that were put forward for this act? And then finally, the argument was made, this is all about protecting private property rights. Um, it really was an argument about promoting the property rights of mining mineral owners, um, but there were a lot of property owners who showed up complaining um, that this is not protecting our rights. This is going to allow mine, our neighbors to uh, mine in ways that will harm our property rights. As you might guess, the arguments against came down to quality of life concerns. Oh my goodness, we're going to have these new mining operations will really diminish my quality of life. Don't, don't, don't do this. The local officials, the MTA, the Michigan Township Association, and the Michigan Municipal League, and the local officials who showed up, not surprisingly, um, pleaded bitterly that this was yet another imposition of state, uh, you know, state authority trampling on local autonomy. Um, frankly, there was some nimbyism going on as well, and in in an uncomfortable way. There, I remember distinctly a property owner coming in and saying gosh, if you let do this, our neighbor is going to be able to start mining. And, and well, we don't own that property, but we've been using it as a long time for a place for my kids to play. And, and don't let them do that. And he then kind of stopped himself and acknowledged, well, maybe that doesn't sound so good. Um, and it didn't. Um, uh, so there's nimbyism going on. And then the big argument that we made is this move is really undermining the ability of local governments to maintain the integrity of their planning and zoning schemes. That you're, you're again, even for a township like Casson Township that did it right, did the planning, did the studies, did the zoning consistent with the planning, restoring Silva will, will completely uh, remove their ability to maintain the integrity of their system. It went through, um, much to the credit of the MTA and the MML, they, they lobbied hard and effectively were lobbying hard with the Michigan Aggregate Association attorney who, as best we could tell, was the primary driver behind this proposed legislation. And they added in quite a few more specific considerations that local governments are to consider when they adopt a zoning ordinance or, or make a decision on a, a mining claim. And it's all of the same kinds of factors that you would expect them to claim. I'm not going to step through them. You can read them. The one notable exception, though, is that there is nothing in any of the factors that are listed for consideration to deal with the integrity of the planning and the zoning scheme. And in fact, we proposed that that be added as a factor, and then the aggregate attorney was adamant that absolutely no mention of planning be added to this legislation at all. We don't want planning at all. We don't want to have to, don't even want it mentioned in the legislature. And nobody on the, on the Senate committee had any um, interest in adding it. And, and to a large extent, the effect of what local governments can now do when they regulate mining is, is to regulate hours of operation, blasting noise, dust control, and only in the most extreme cases where they basically cannot show that they can mitigate problems through those kinds of regulations can they refuse to rezone to allow a mining operation to take place. Now, since then, I'm going to turn this back to Mark to talk briefly because Casson Township is getting whipsawed back and forth a little bit because of these changes in law. And after the legislature acted, the Casson Township Board has adopted a new zoning ordinance that speaks to some of these considerations. And <clears throat> this action in Casson Township has just taken place within the last couple of weeks. 
And basically, you may recall from Trudy's presentation that the township had done a study before they established the gravel district in the first place, um, showing that uh, where there were quality gravel resources and that those resources were adequate to meet the regional need for sand and gravel for uh, many, many, many decades into the future. And so one of the things about this new zoning um, provision that was put in restoring the very serious consequences rule was that the industry does have to demonstrate that there's a market, but you have a township which already has a gravel district in place and shows there is, any, is no need to expand the district because there's already uh, an adequate uh, uh, supply within the area that they've already zoned. But uh, as you might imagine, as soon as Kaiser found out about the new uh, amendments to the Zoning Enabling Act uh, and to other landowners who had had interest in expanding the gravel district <clears throat> to include more land, immediately came forward and petitioned the uh, township to expand the sand and gravel district. Well, now that the uh, township has adopted the new regulations that they believe are consistent with the new statutory scheme, the, um, um, the issue will start to take on uh, a new character. The township will have to take some formal action relative to any formal applications to rezone uh, and or they'll face uh, new litigation um, uh, over the, um, the issue of not permitting an expansion uh, of the district or considering expansion of the district only according to the new rules and standards uh, that have been established. Okay, so we're almost almost at the end here. I just want to talk briefly about what you know. I, I talked a minute ago about why the act itself, what what was driving this notion that that the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act needed to be revised and to have this special protection for minerals put back in. But then they wanted, we wanted to step back and ask, well, why did the legislature act? What's going on with this? A legislative decision. And, and Mark and I um, just wrote a piece, I'll mention in a minute, that was published in the Planning and Environmental Law uh, Journal. And our assessment is there were three primary driving factors be that led to the legislature to act as it did. The first was term limits. Michigan is now feeling the full effects of having passed term limits about two decades ago that pretty severely limit the time in office for state representatives, state senators, and the governor. And, and the end result of that is a legislature that has absolutely no institutional memory. Um, all, of the, all of the legislators are, have been there for a short period of time. They know they're on, only going to be there for a short period of time. There's very much a sense on the part of most administrators, or uh, legislators rather, that they want to make some big piece of legislation with their name on it as quickly as they can before they term limit it out and then they can go off and say they did something. And even conventionally people say, well, if you limit legislators, their administrative staffs will at least have some memory. But my, my sense is in the Michigan legislature, most of the administrative staff move on as well. The legislators bring in their own staff and even those folks don't have much institutional memory. So we now have a legislature that um, just has a very short time frame on its thinking. And, and is trying to move quickly to push through the legislation that they want to push through without really thinking through the long-term consequences. Let me get some pushback on that assertion, perhaps from some Michigan legislators. Um, the second big problem is, is that our government in Michigan now is entirely a single party uh, government. The, the State House, the State Senate, and the Governor's Office are all held uh, in Republican hands. And I'm not critiquing the fact that they're Republican, what really was the problem was that they're entirely a single party. And so what that meant was there was no real check to the movement of this legislation through the state legislature in lightning speed because um, the, the Democrat, there was no opposing party that had an ability to slow things down. And, and our sense was, had they even drawn out the Senate hearing another week or two to allow more voices to be heard on, wait a minute, this may not be a prudent thing to do probably would have had effective shelving this legislation before it got enacted. So when you get into a unipolitical system where there's no real partisan check on, on one party moving everything through quickly, um, things can move very quickly and that can lead to problems. The third big reason, I think, Mark and I think, um, for this shift um, 
comes back to rest on planners and local government shoulders to some extent. There's a reason the courts in the 1980s adopted a constitutional adjudication rule that protected mining, and, and that was because local governments in Michigan had gotten very good at finding all kinds of ways to keep mining out that through their planning and zoning schemes that effectively were consistently excluding them. And so the mining industry was justifiably frustrated that it couldn't develop new mines because they were constantly being zoned out. So they went to the courts to seek redress, and the courts responded with this constitutional adjudication rule. The Michigan Supreme Court in Kaiser said that was not appropriate for us to do. This isn't a pot, you know, courts don't make policy, legislatures do. We're kicking it back to the legislature. So what did the mining industry do? It went back to the legislature and said, look, the court is no longer giving us the protection we need. That's a bad thing to do. We want you to give us the protection we need. And they found legislators who were willing to, to carry that water for them. And so there's, a, there's an institutional dialogue going on here. Um, and part of that has to come back to how local governments have treated planning and zoning um, and mining in the past. So uh, that past practice. <coughs> And, and frankly, not doing a good job of engaging the industry sooner. So it's very much at the end of a, a, long, um, a long history. So quickly to wrap up, what are some lessons? The first lesson, the lesson that we stressed when we were in Boston, is that constitutional law can change. That when we started down this road, everybody said, this is never going to change. The court will never reverse itself. Why are you wasting your time? And lo and behold, we got the Michigan Supreme Court to revisit things and to actually change their mind. And we were all quite happy with that. And now our maxim has come back because the council law can change when the legislature steps in as well. Um, so boy, it sure is more dynamic and fluid than any of us thought. Um, I think another lesson is there's still some meat to the idea of separation of powers and deferential judicial review, and that means something. It certainly held sway with our Michigan Supreme Court. But especially after the Legislative Act this summer, mineral resources are not on par with other land uses. They've been elevated back to a preferred land use status by virtue of the amendments that were made. And so the upshot is that localities in Michigan to take can regulate mining, but only in extreme cases. And they have to really clearly show that the regulations are reasonable and limited in scope and compelling. And that's going to take a lot of work on the part of local officials to be able to regulate mining given the new uh, shift. Um, in other words, good planning is key, but it ain't over till it's over, and even then when you think it's over, maybe it's not really over. <laughs> so again, Mark and I just uh, had a piece published on this that kind of lays out, it focuses more on the legislative change this summer and, and provides some more detailed discussion on that, um, that if this is interesting to you, you might take a look at that in the planning and environmental law. And with that, that's the end of our formal presentation. And so I'm going to turn it back to David to moderate. Well, I think you can see why this uh, session rose to the level of the Bettman Symposium. It was, uh, there were some very significant legal issues here that needed uh, the kind of horsepower that Trudy and Mark and, and Dick were able to provide. Uh, we do have, uh, by my glance at the attendee list, about 528 people that are currently listening to this uh, webinar, so I'm sure we're going to get quite a number of questions. We have a, a few that have come in already. Uh, the first one uh, goes to Trudy, um, Trudy's presentation, and I suppose it could be answered by uh, one or more of, of our presenters. Uh, and that question is, what was the legal argument for removing staff as witnesses in the case? Um, you know, I'd have to go back and look on that. I don't recall the actual legal argument. Um, I do remember there being some issue, particularly with my testimony because I live in that township. I'm on the northern edge of that township. And during my deposition, there were some questions regarding my perception of very serious consequences and how a rezoning might affect me or my family. So I have a feeling that was part of it. As far as the other professional planner and why he was being requested to be removed, I don't know. I'd have to look back at the, at the initial case. I don't, if I can add, I, I don't know the reasons for this particular decision, but it wouldn't be unusual for an attorney to try and move to get any witness that doesn't prevent favorable testimony removed. 
So it's, in that sense, it wasn't unusual for the plaintiff's attorney to ask that these, these two folks be removed as witnesses. As the moderator, I, I work very frequently as an expert witness, and it's very common for the other side to attempt to have me discredited and my, and my testimony not allowed. Um, no one has ever been successful to date, but that doesn't mean that it might not happen. A uh, question for Mark, can an argument be made for regulatory taking of property owners uh, who own property which could be mined but are prohibited because they're located outside of the gravel districts? Well, the first thing to keep in mind relative to a takings allegation like this is what are the other land uses that are already permitted on those properties outside the district? And if you remember the maps that Trudy uh, illustrated at the beginning of the program, there were agricultural and residential uh, uses of land in, in, in one area or two areas, I believe it was, some commercial uses of land that were permitted. The properties in question, the Kaiser property, is being used as a farm and had been used uh, productively as a farm for uh, several generations. Uh, so it already had an existing land use which was a lawful land use. And the same was true relative to each of the two other properties which are now proposed for rezoning outside of the district. So the burden would be on those proposing to demonstrate that there was a takings and the challenge that they would have to overcome is that the uses that are already authorized uh, are not reasonable under the circumstance and, and wouldn't permit a reasonable return uh, on the ownership interest. Uh, Dick, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Don't do it when people say no and then they talk. <laughs> um, it would not be a Loretto taking, not a physical invasion. It, it wouldn't be a Lucas taking unless it would be an extreme case where gravel mining is the only economically viable use of the land and absolutely nothing else is economically viable. It's hard to imagine that taking place. And that would put it into a Penn Central balancing, ad hoc balancing test kind of taking claim. And for exactly the reasons that Mark just laid out, it's very unlikely. You know, most Penn Central takings claims do not prevail because there's almost always some economically productive use of the regulation. And then especially if the government has now had to go to great extremes to show that we're regulating this because of the great harm that a gravel mining operation would pose. Um, and presumably there are other viable uses of the land other than gravel mining. It, it's hard to see that, that that a takings claim would prevail here. I don't think Kaiser would have had a successful takings claim on the facts of this particular case. We have a fairly complex question here for Dick. Uh, is there any trace of a connection between the legislative action taken in 2011, that would be by the Michigan legislature, and the American Legislative Executive Council uh, who are identified as a major behind-the-scenes player in state legislation around the country that shifts uh, greater power toward businesses. Uh, the reason that the um, uh, person asking this question raises ALEC as a concern is that if they were instrumental in moving the Michigan legislation, uh, they may be likely to challenge similar zoning and planning uh, claims in other states. I did not see any evidence that there were any players involved in this legislation other than, than local Michigan folks. And, and the, the primary players that were pushing for this legislation that I could tell was, was the Michigan Aggregates Association attorney and some, some folks. And there, there, were a lot, there was a lot of discussion going on with those folks uh, before and during the state Senate hearings. Um, I don't think they knew who I was because they were talking freely as I was standing there listening to them. Um, and, and, uh, and the thing that struck me the most was they were so utterly surprised that the Michigan Supreme Court had reversed itself in Kaiser because clearly from their perspective they thought that Silva made sense, that this, this constitutional rule that gave special protection to mining was a completely logical and coherent thing, you know, coherent law for the state of Michigan to have and that their main interest was getting that law reinstated. And, and that's actually why they specifically insisted that the Silva rule, the Silva law, the Silva case, be mentioned in the statute by name. 
and it does now. This Michigan Zoning Enabling Act refers specifically back to this prior uh, Supreme Court decision, which is very unusual, uh, not heard of. And, and so I think it was very much a response of the Michigan Mining Association trying to correct what they saw had been an imprudent uh, shift on the part of the uh, Michigan Supreme Court. I didn't see any evidence that there were outside actors who were kind of pushing that or, or motivating it. But you're right, there are certainly, you know, thinking back to the Kelo case, um, quite often property rights claims get picked up by national interest groups that are trying to use uh, court cases to, to make headway where they can't get legislatures to act. Um, and so that concern that there might be interest groups out there kind of um, underwriting these actions is a, is a real one and something to be on the, on the lookout for. The next question uh, asks whether um, or asks how a public agency would determine that there's a need for the particular resources and the focus of this question is that would tax dollars end up having to be used to essentially fund a private market study? I know that's a good question and I think that'll be something where we have to see how it plays out. I think I think what the way it'll play out frankly is that the, the local government will tell the person moving or requesting for the rezoning to provide some market studies that show the need. So they'll try and shift the burden onto the property owner to demonstrate um, that there is a regional need for these minerals. And if the, if the private landowner can't do that, then, then the government will make the assertion there's no demonstrated need for these resources. And, and it'll be in the interest of the landowner to make that showing. So I, I, I wouldn't expect local governments to have to spend a whole lot of money themselves trying to make that demonstration. They probably want to review critically whatever the property owner may claims in terms of regional need. Um, but I, I wouldn't expect that this can be a huge issue. And I would agree with Dick uh, relative to responding to a request. But if you're in a jurisdiction that has a lot of mineral resources and you know you have those resources, you would be uh, best advised to inventory those resources incorporate that into your planning process and decide how you're going to reasonably um, approve requests for mining because and and in, in doing that you will have a lot of background material that can help you make your own determination as to whether or not there is a uh, demonstrated need or a market need for that resource otherwise you do have to respond simply to what the applicant is going to present to you I do know from my planning practice, uh, I serve a lot of small rural communities. I have reviewed many applications for gravel mining over the years, and I know that most small communities don't have the financial resources to do that type of analysis. Uh, they can look at things like the, uh, the USDA soil survey, but but the sampling that's done for the soil survey only goes to a depth of five feet. And a lot of these, I have seen mining resources, uh, significant high value mineral resources that are down 90 and 100 feet below the surface. Uh, so I think that that is a, a very significant burden on uh, a small community to try to inventory those resources. It could be that um, they have to look to existing operations in their communities in the vicinity and, and where those veins of sand and gravel and mineral resources exist and, and uh, perhaps look at some university studies uh, that might assist. But it is a very difficult problem for a local unit of government to try to do that type of inventory. If you ask those three questions, I can respond to uh, we have a few more questions that have just come in. Um, what happens to the burden of proof argument? Sounds like the burden is still on the municipality to deny, uh, to deny, not the applicant to show that there's a need that an adopted plan does not meet or address. Um, we have some related ones. Uh, any future challengers to the legislation that's uh, planned? I think the legislation's passed. And uh, the same reasoning could be used to justify the protection of other common resources such as forests and wetlands against bad local planning decisions related to such resources, could it not? So, the, so I suggested to David that we combine these questions because they're all kind of related. Um, 
the, the first question, the, the caller is correct. Because of the legislation, the burden is effectively back now on the municipality to show that there's a compelling need to regulate this mining operation. Um, and absent that showing on the part of the municipality, it's basically precluded from, from regulating the mining. So the legislation has had the effect that the, that the proponents, exactly the effect the proponents wanted, which was to increase substantially the burden on local governments to zone in a way that significantly regulates mining activities. Um, the next question is, do, are there any intent? I, I'm reading the question to be, is anybody getting ready to litigate to challenge the legislature's actions is to find that that is the wrong thing to do? And you might initially think, well, surely the legislature couldn't have done that because the court just found that it was unconstitutional and reversed it. Well, the main reason the court struck down its own prior decision was that the court ruled it's not our job as the court to set natural resource policy. It's the legislature's job to do so. And therefore, we're striking down Silva. So in a way, when the legislature came back and said, OK, then we'll elevate mining as a preferred land use, the court will likely look at that and say, that's fine. That's, that's within the realm of the legislature to make that policy. We're not going to strike that down, even if it has the effect of making it virtually impossible for a local government to regulate mining. And oh, by the way, the legislature's already done that. It specifically prohibits townships from zoning out oil and gas operations. It has other provisions that limit local government's ability to, to uh, zone out group homes, things like that. So there's nothing untoward in a policy sense with what the legislature did that way. The one place that it might successfully litigate is, is and I, we didn't mention this, but part of the reasoning of the court was that the Silva decision had the effect of turning trial courts into super zoning commissions, that it really makes the trial court become the ultimate policy maker on whether or not a given zoning um, regulation is required vis-a-vis -vis the need for zoning and the you know, need for minerals and such. And, and I could see if in future, future cases, but that is still happening, that this no very serious consequences rule is effectively turning the courts into case-by-case -case policy makers. The Supreme Court might bite on that and say this, this legislation was imprudent, but it, that's a, probably not a winning argument. It's hard to see this law changing through litigation. It's probably going to need to change th through more legislation, if, if anything. And then finally, can the same reasoning be used to justify protection for common resources such as forests and wetlands against bad local planning decisions? I'm, I think I'm understanding the question to raise some alarm that the legislature has, um, is kind of mucking around with local autonomy on issues of regional concern. I think the main difference, if I'm understanding the question correctly, is that mining is being presented as a productive commercial use of property um, that prevents, pro provides a public good in the sense of adequate mineral resources. Um, and there's a very uh, interested part of, on the part of the property owner to develop the land that way. Most other common pool resources like forests and wetlands and such don't have private property owners who are looking to make serious quantities of money off of their forests or wetlands who are going to push this kind of legislation to take place. So I, I guess what I'm getting at is it's not clear to me that the way the legislature and the courts have been acting with regard to minerals is going to carry over into larger questions about the protection of forests and wetlands. Um, I think yeah, we, we, uh, we have only a few minutes left and a lot of questions rolling in. I've got, uh, I'm going to try to combine four of them here and this may be the last one that we can try to address. Um, and, and these are all very closely related. What is the market that must be shown to justify protecting uh, the mining resource? Where does the township's gravel get used? Um, and then what is the region and do you consider all gravel supplies within the region? So is it just within the township or does it extend to the region? Are there states that have comprehensive mineral inventories? And why does the demand for minerals and land use uh, delineation have to be narrowly limited to regional needs. What about the, the uh, uh, consideration of export potential? Well, <clears throat> let me start uh, on that. Uh, the market that must be shown to justify uh, uh, protecting the mineral resource, um, this is 
really the market in the region for the use of the resource. And uh, Leland Rock County, if you had a chance to see the, one of the first maps that Trudy had up, is uh, very close to uh, Traverse City, which is the largest city in that, um, that region. And so the region being served is basically region. And if you have any experience with, uh, with minerals, you know that they don't get uh, transported a long distance before they're used because they're very heavy and it costs a lot uh, to transport them. So you're basically talking uh, typically not more than a 30 mile uh, radius, uh, which is uh, probably about 10 or 12 miles uh, from Casson to the center of Traverse City. Uh, the second one there is uh, what states have comprehensive mineral inventories. Uh, the only ones that I'm familiar with are um, Minnesota and Illinois, uh, and they may not be comprehensive relative to all minerals. Uh, in Minnesota's case, it may only be in the major metropolitan areas. Uh, but I'm guessing there probably are other states uh, that have done so. Those are the only ones that I happen to have some familiarity with. And then um, that third question that's related, why does the man, demand for minerals and land use district delineation have to be narrowly limited to regional needs for those resources and not consider export potential? Um, it's a very good question. It's uh, not one that uh, Dick wants to add something here. Uh, well, um, most of the gravel that's being mined is going into aggregates and concrete production. And what I heard through the course of these proceedings was that they don't travel very far. Um, there's really no market for exporting, we, and particularly in Michigan. So much of the state is underlain by gravel, it wouldn't make sense to try and send it anywhere else, and it's expensive to haul. In my experience, the, the principal um, time where, where it does get transported ported further is when it's limestone and it can be moved by boat on the Great Lakes. And, and it's only going to another Great Lakes city in that particular instance, uh, typically for uh, iron uh, and steel manufacture. Um, and that's also been my experience. Yeah. So I would add to uh, all of these issues about the regional market and such, is none of that's laid out clearly in the legislation. It's all going to be determined through litigation. I mean, that, those are questions that will be litigated probably um, as different jurisdictions now struggle with these new laws. And, and, and we'll see how that pans out. Add on to that real quickly is not all of these mines are privately owned. The local road commissions also have sand and gravel operations, and they use it for a lot of the work that they do within the region. And then I think the question also referred back, or one of the questions did on the commercial aspect of it. And in the language that Casson Township recently adopted, they have definitions for the commercial and the commercial market, and the applicant has to show those needs and bring the documentation forward. So. They have tried to address that and spell that out in their new language amendment. We are at the end of uh, our time for today. Um, and there are a number of questions that we just can't get to, but we will uh, attempt to provide some answers to those um, at the, uh, at the uh, archive point for the webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Trudy Gala. Mark Wyckoff and Dick Norton for their presentation today. And I'd like to thank the Michigan chapter and Andrea Brown for hosting us here in Ann Arbor. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we hope you enjoy today's session. Thank you. Um, you know, if anyone wants to reach me and has any specific questions regarding what happened in Leelanau County, I'd be glad to accept the emails and, and get some information back to them.